thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank, thank, thank. Um, I do, I do want to start out by saying um, this, this is friggin' awesome. Um, this really is. And, and yeah, cl- applaud for your awesomeness, please. Do it. Nancy and Jen and Shannon worked so hard, and I mean, this is, this is awesome. Um, so let's see. There I am again. So let me tell you how the whole thing started. I was working on a different documentary project in Shreveport, Louisiana, and I was in this little cafe called Strawn's, and these two farmers walk in off the street, straight out of Central Casting, and they sit down near me, and they start talking about this secret natural gas well. As they were talking about it, they started speaking about how they crawled under this fence, checked this pressure gauge, and how it was going to make millions of dollars for its landowner. To me, my interest was piqued, and as I listened more and more around Shreveport, Louisiana, I started hearing more and more about these secret, secret natural, natural gas wells. Excuse me. Well, I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also an eternal optimist. So that means I think if you put a camera on something, it automatically makes a movie. Um, <laughs> in, in this particular case, um, I, was, I was right. Um, the time that it sued in the, um, in the area was incredible. The, the, the energy, the fervor, um, the, really the, the, the culture of the whole area changed. And we ended up finding three lives to document, and I'd like to introduce you to those lives right now. going to renovate all these buildings. All these buildings, kids will run the halls in these buildings again. Teachers will teach in these buildings again. This looks so devastating it seems as if there's no hope, but we believe that there is hope. We don't know who may be the next president. We don't know who may be the next governor, the next judge, the next teacher, the next mayor. You know, we, we don't know, but what we believe, we believe that we are making an eternal investment to change the whole world. These people can't just pick up and move. They're still going to live here. And the quality of life has got to still be a good quality of life. One of the reasons that I have shouted from the mountaintop, so to speak, is because I did not want people unfairly treated. From the difference in what they're paying people based on socioeconomics, to not taking people's homes and land seriously and protecting it. I think gun is a man's best friend. There's, there's not a corner in this house that I can't pick up a gun and protect myself. Everybody should own a 22 automatic. Most people that I know have a Remington 1100 automatic shotgun. This is uh, old Bertha, 30 alt six. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but the notches here. There's 63 deer on there. I've killed a million deer with this. So um, there you have it. You met the three characters. And by the way, for any single women in the audience, Mike is available. (laughs) Um, But through the film, you get to see their life's ambitions, the good and the bad of what happens to them during this Haynesville boom. And it's, it's a pretty amazing story as you kind of get to experience the three of them and the way they sort of interact with the boom. But what was interesting was, as we're filming their lives, something very fascinating happened. And it was that the Haynesville, which the the formation was called the Haynesville, the Haynesville Shale was proven to be real. And it was proven to be vast. In fact, right now, the Haynesville is known as being the most productive natural gas field in the United States. And it's so vast that the Haynesville alone could run the U.S. residential electricity output for the next 40 plus years. It's big. It's big. So we decided as a production that what we had to do is we had to create context. We had to have people understand what all this energy meant. And as a result, we kind of had to understand it too. So we assembled a group 
of academics, pundits, and environmentalists like Bill McKibben to help us make sense of it all. And in the end, they gave us some very interesting revelations. The first revelation was that energy is complicated. Energy is really, really complicated. It's so entwined and ensconced in our lives that we don't really think about it. Yet, energy is how most of us got here today. Energy is what runs the communication devices that keep flashing in the audience. Energy is what allows me to be seen and also heard way up there in the back. So energy is complicated. The second revelation came in this idea of current energy sources. I'm not sure that I knew how much coal we used, but we use over 50 percent, uh, or we use 50 percent of coal to actually run all the electricity in the United States, and coal is dirty. Coal is really, really dirty. From the moment they blow the top off a mountain to the moment they burn it and they put mercury into the air to when they store it, coal is dirty. It's so dirty, in fact, that the CDC recently did a study that said that 600,000 asthma attacks a year are caused because of the burning of coal. And what's worse is that 30,000 Americans a year die because they live close to a plant that burns coal. So to be clear, because their house is close to a coal-burning plant, they die prematurely, 30,000 people. That's astounding. So we had our enemy. We had our current fuel source that we wanted to move away from. Well, we kind of thought, why not go to wind and solar? Well, our renewable entrepreneurs and our environmentalists kind of put us on a different track. In fact, they're the ones who told us that wind and solar aren't necessarily ready right now. Wind and solar run about 1.1% of the energy in the United States, and I'm not sure I knew that either. And what's worse is there is no storage for wind and solar. There's no big battery out there that actually stores that power. They're developing one now, but there's not one that's there right now. So with those revelations in mind, we really put it on our experts to help us figure out where to go. And what they came back with was pretty startling. Um, they came back with a solution that was rational, it was give and take, and best, it is sustainable and attainable for us. And I'd like to, I'd like to give you guys just a sneak peek at that solution right now. The answer to our energy problem is we have to use it all. We can't just use wind and solar, we can't just use natural gas. We have to use it all, and we have to use it wisely. We have to use it more efficiently. And I really think we have to consider uh, this Haynesville Shale Reserve uh, as an insurance policy. Because the resource is so large, and because it may have such a large impact on the U.S. economy, what it effectively does, it buys us time to become more efficient, to develop new sources of energy, and to live more in harmony with the planet. And that is a unique and last opportunity for the United States. There will not be any other. Time for a new way of thinking about the world. Hopefully one where we would use less energy and produce less carbon. If you look at sort of in history, we've been so much about fossil fuels. We want to go to something maybe that has a lot more clean energy, if not predominantly clean energy. But in that middle, during these decades here in the middle, we're going to have to go through more of a balanced scenario where we're using a lot of different things with a clear plan that we're going to transition to these clean energy sources of the future. It's very difficult to predict the future and we've been known to be quite unable to do so. But I think that chances of us having very rich and fulfilling lives and live very happily closer to the planet, and when I say closer, understanding better the environment in which we persist, uh, I think these chances are very high. So there you have it. We had a film. We had the human side. We had our big context. Now we had to figure out a place to play it. And this is that point in time where if there are any filmmakers that are out there that you are hoping for a semblance of a chance to refill your savings account, um, or in my case, pay back my parents. Um, <laughs> so the first two invitations that we got for the film were pretty amazing. Um, the first invitation that we got was to show the film at the Sheffield Documentary Festival. And if you're a documentary filmmaker, this is a huge honor. But what kind of freaked us out a little bit was we were invited as a nominee for the Green Doc Award. Now, we'd always thought about our film as a human film. 
we had just never thought of our film as an energy film. Out of Sheffield came a special invitation to go to the World Climate Summit in Copenhagen and show the film there. And again, we were invited in as an energy film. And what was pretty awesome was the buzz around the film at the conference was here was a film that presented an attainable and balanced give and take energy solution. By the time we got back stateside to show the film at the South by Southwest Film Festival, things had changed pretty dramatically. The issue of energy had become hyperpolarized. We had Sarah Palin on one side of the issue saying we had to drill anywhere and everywhere with reckless abandon and no environmental conscience at all. We had the film Gasland, which said you can drill anywhere. You had wind projects in Cape Cod causing controversy. You had coal mines seemingly blowing up everywhere. You had the BP oil disaster spilling oil into the Gulf. And what it did was it really polarized the people. It drove people to one side of the issue or the other, where all they would do is lob insults at each other. And here was the worst part about it to us. We had seen all this progress that we'd filmed before towards the clean energy future cease moving forward. The progression had stopped. Energy is complicated, and it's complicated here because it divided us. And again, it stopped this progress that we had seen, this progress that we had seen come together with our film, these people from all these different sides of the spectrum coming together, we had seen it dissipate, come to a screeching stop. But there was a glimmer of hope. And the glimmer of hope was that because of the topical nature of energy and because of the polarized views that were out there, everybody wanted to see Haynesville. They packed the house. I mean, we packed, wherever we went, people wanted to come and see what kind of view we had. And they came from one side of the issue or the other side of the issue, and we played the film everywhere. We played it at film festivals. We played it at environmental summits. We played it at energy advocacy conferences. We played it in communities. We even played it in Washington, D.C. And here's where the hope came in. People would come see the film, and again, they would come from one side of the issue or the other, and they would sit down in the audience, and the lights would go down, and the film would play, and the lights would come up, and people would start talking about the energy future. People would bring their, their preconceived notions, and they would come to this place where we ended up calling it the, the rational middle. They'd come to this place in the middle where they would discuss the issues in the film and start trying to progress what the energy future was and how to move it forward. Energy is complicated. And here, energy is complicated because energy makes up who we are as people and where we live. It is going to make up who we will be and the place that we will live. So if you believe that, you got to think right now things aren't so great. You have oil prices spiking. You have coal being burned as much as ever. You don't have enough thinking going into renewable technologies or making them more affordable, not even to say the storage side of things. We're not even giving enough regard to conservation, which is a really easy idea to get the energy future moving. And we're not even thinking about what place this natural gas could play to move that future forward. So with that in mind, it doesn't matter if you're pro-wind or if you're anti-coal or you're a lover of geothermal. The fact is we've got to start working on this right now. Because here's a funny thing about the energy future as we learn in the making of this film, is that if you don't start working on the energy future now, the energy future will work itself out. And that's not a very painless process. <laughs> but there is a glimmer of hope, or I should say an opportunity. The opportunity is that we have a government that is keenly aware and excited about a clean energy future. We have an energy industry that is full of innovation. They want a place at this table. They want to be able to put their innovation on the table, and they want to sell it to us, which is fine. But most of all, and what is one of the more exciting things about it, and I was recently told this by an expert from the film, that for the first time in history, there's a populist movement in energy, and we all have a voice. We all have a voice in this energy future. You know, we've seen it work with Haynesville. 
We've seen Haynesville bring people to this rational middle, and we've seen Haynesville bring people to a place where they are discussing and progressing the energy future. Because in the end, we are going to be the ones that are going to be the primary architects. We are the ones that are going to change the trajectory of the energy future. But we're not going to do it unless we work together. We're not going to do it unless we break this stasis and we come out of these places on one side and the other, meet in the rational middle, and sit at this table and look each other in the eye and listen. And together, we will decide where we are as an energy nation, where we want to go, and most importantly, how we intend to get there. Thank you.